And in Kuwait City, relief and celebration. The war is over. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Tonight, America at Peace. Reporting from Kuwait City, Tom Brokaw with Jane Pauley in New York. Good evening from Kuwait City. Well, now even Saddam Hussein gets it. His army and his claims of superiority have been completely wiped out. So now Saddam Hussein finally is accepting President Bush's terms for surrender. We have NBC John Cochran at the White House again tonight. Fred Francis at his post at the Pentagon. John, let's begin with you and the good news. Tom, although the president said he was impressed by the reception that the Kuwaiti people gave to American GIs, he seemed almost embarrassed when the Kuwaiti ambassador came here to express his gratitude. But before I say what's the president on, told the ambassador there was more good news, news from Baghdad. The Iraqi government uh, has now agreed to uh, designate military commanders to meet with coalition counterparts to arrange for the military aspects of this ceasefire. Bush said the meetings will take place very soon, and the prime topic will be the release of POWs and civilians held by the Iraqis. And we are going to get back our POWs, and we're going to do it fast. But today was more a time for George Bush to thank his troops and to receive thanks. There isn't, I believe, a more precious gift that could be given to people than their freedom and their liberty and their homeland. And Mr. President, you have done this. And you will go down in history as the great liberator of my country. You and I both know it was the privates and the sergeants and the first lieutenants and the generals that uh, deserve the credit. It is a special day and ambassador. I just can't tell you what's in my heart, but I, I am very pleased, very proud that your country's free. The Saudi ambassador, Prince Bandar, told the president that American troops prevented a certain invasion of his country by Iraqi forces. You should be very proud of the United States Armed Forces. They did a marvelous job. Mrs. Bush went to an army base to express her thanks to the living and the dead. You know, with all the joy and pride we feel today, we also feel a deep sorrow for those precious young men and women who won't come home. We will never forget them. A lot of emotions were evident at the White House today. Sorrow, relief, pride, and a deep satisfaction at sticking it to Saddam. Tom? Thank you, John Cochran at the White House. Well, the president's triumph in the Persian Gulf has brought him soaring public support at home. Our latest NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows 85% of the public approves of the job the president is doing. That's the highest level of support for a president since Harry S. Truman when Germany surrendered in June 1945. And Fred Francis at the Pentagon now, I gather they are already planning to bring some American troops home. That's right, Tom. If the peace holds, the first combat pilots and foot soldiers will be home within three weeks. But it will take up to a year, according to Pentagon officials, to pull out all American forces. You've got a force in and around Kuwait providing security for Kuwait. And then you've got other forces that are safeguarding the U.S. troops that are doing that job. Pentagon sources say a security zone in southern Iraq will require at least a division of U.S. tanks and men, roughly 20,000 soldiers for up to a year. Also, say Pentagon officials, at least two aircraft carrier battle groups will be required for regional security for up to one year. The USS Nimitz and the USS Forrestal will be sent to the Gulf region from the states to take up that duty. And finally, say officials, at least 72 tactical fighters will be staying somewhere on the Arabian Peninsula until 1992. But the first troops to come home will be the first ones to defend Saudi Arabia last August. The 18,000 men and women of the 82nd Airborne, soldiers from the 101st Airborne, and a tank unit from Fort Stewart, Georgia, the 24th Mechanized Division. It was that tank division which late yesterday fought the most important single battle of the ground campaign. The 24th, with attack helicopter support, destroyed more than 200 Iraqi tanks in one engagement west of Basra, Iraq. It will take three months, say officials, to repair, steam clean, and load all the other heavy tanks and combat equipment. 
and another three to six months to load and ship the millions of tons of bombs, supplies, and other war materials, as well as all the men and women who came with it. Uh, it was a Herculean uh, logistic task to get them there. Uh, and thank God, because our casualties were so light, it's going to be just about as Herculean to get them back. The guiding policy, Tom, is to demonstrate to the Arab world that the U.S. will pull out its offensive army with almost the same speed as it arrived, but to leave just enough firepower there to handle a small crisis. Tom? Thank you, Fred Francis. Well, here in Kuwait City, the end of the war brought feelings of relief and anger and celebration. Kuwaiti troops were the stars of the day as they staged a noisy, impromptu parade along Kuwait's waterfront. A short while later, U.S. Marines claimed the U.S. Embassy. They detonated landmines the Iraqis planted on their grounds and swept the building for booby traps. Just down the road, the British ambassador was glad to be back on the job. Kuwait City, however, remains a dangerous place. There's lots of unexploded ammunition. The Iraqis were dug in here all along the shoreline of Kuwait City, awaiting the amphibious landing that wasn't necessary, and they left in such a hurry. There are still cases of rocket grenades. Kuwaiti police rounded up this storeroom of weapons once the Iraqis fled as the ground war advanced. Some of the crates were marked from the Jordan military which will not help King Hussein's case with the West. These policemen were glad to reclaim their jobs, but they all had tales of abuse, torture, and kidnapping. This man lost his 15-year-old son to the Iraqis, a young resistance fighter. He showed me a scar where he said the Iraqi troops tried to burn an S for Saddam on his arm. I have my friends. I have my friends that killed them. They killed them in, in axe. You know the axe? With an axe? They killed yeah, your friends with an axe? axe. The policeman produced an Iraqi soldier who had surrendered. He said he was a businessman who was pressed into service just two months ago. If I refused to uh, come to here, uh, me and Officer Saddam Hussein is, uh, take my uh, sister or my wife or my mother, I cannot say no. And what does he think of Saddam Hussein now? I, I, I want to, to him kill. There are fresh memories of the bad times for seven months. A form of vigilante justice is setting in. A suspected collaborator was arrested and hauled off. Civilian guards questioned motorists, looking especially for Palestinian collaborators. Animals, not the human, animals. On another corner, not the human, Kuwaitis burn an Iraqi flag. Their final rejection of the idea of Kuwait as the 19th province of Saddam Hussein. But for the most part, the celebration brought scenes from times gone by. Rock and roll! American GIs as heroes. This baby was born during the crisis and has never been free until today. <laughs> In our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, we also learned, no surprise, that the military leaders of Operation Desert Storm are also held in high esteem by the American public. Joint Chiefs Chairman Colin Powell, General Norman Schwarzkopf, and Defense Secretary Dick Cheney, all at the same high level. In just a moment, when Nightly News continues, Jane Pauley in New York talking with Tom Aspel in Baghdad. Or in the Persian Gulf, keep your radio set on WCBS for the first word from the front line. More than just the headlines, WCBS News Radio 88 turned out to be a humiliation, a destruction of the economy and a defeat of the army. As the world ponders Saddam's future, the people of Iraq ponder their own. NBC's Tom Aspel is in Baghdad. Since early morning, there have been mixed emotions here. People are happy that the ceasefire means an end to the killing, but they are anxious about their future. If there was ever a day to make a brand new start in life here, today was it. A little happiness is going to have to go a long way around here from now on. Most people are depressed. There's a feeling of relief that the war is over, but there is bitterness too. Iraq's adventure in Kuwait has cost this country its place in the Arab world, although Baghdad Radio and the daily newspapers are claiming a victory. The ruling Ba'ath Party newspaper Al Thawra called it a great Arab achievement. 
A front page editorial said, Iraq's power remains intact. A commentary on Baghdad radio said, victory is not how many tanks or planes we or the enemy used, victory is the face which you acquire in the history books. That face the newspapers talked about was nowhere to be seen here today. I don't think our army is suffer as much as our uh, people. Our people suffer a lot. For what? For what? For nothing. The cost to Iraq in dollars and deaths probably won't be counted for a long time. But there's little doubt that the country is shattered, bombed to a total standstill. Everyone here knows it. Tonight, as darkness fell, Baghdad was lit once more by traces and flares. But this time, it wasn't to ward off attacking warplanes. It was a celebration of sorts, of a peace of sorts. There are still details, prisoner exchanges, compensation, recrimination. But Iraq's first priority is to rebuild this country. Tom Aspel, NBC News, Baghdad. War often produces technological innovations that alter the course of military history. Rail transport in the Civil War, nuclear weapons in World War II. This time, high-tech smart weapons. NBC science correspondent Robert Bazell. The sands of Iraq and Kuwait are littered with thousands of tanks and pieces of armor destroyed by new high-tech weapons used in battle for the first time. Experts say these weapons, fired from planes, from tanks, and from helicopters, made history in Operation Desert Storm, and that they will change the very nature of warfare. We could have won the war without high-tech weaponry, but we could not have won it with so few casualties and in such a short amount of time. Literally tens of thousands of Americans probably owe their health or their lives to these weapons. Before the war with Iraq, dozens of bombs or shells had to be released to try to destroy any target. Predictions that aerial or naval bombardment would lessen enemy resistance often proved wrong. During World War II, Allied planes and ships bombed the island of Iwo Jima for 74 days, but the Marines who went ashore still suffered enormous casualties. But Desert Storm saw the first large-scale use of laser-guided smart weapons that often destroy a target with the first shot. With these weapons, an airplane, tank, or helicopter crew member locates the target in a rangefinder. This shines a laser beam on the target. Guidance systems on the bomb or missile lock in on that laser beam to hit the target precisely. Many of the weapons used against the Iraqis functioned as well in the dark or through smoke as they did in bright sunshine. Most of the new weapons were built in the 80s at great cost. What this campaign shows that these weapons can work on the battlefield. We've had many critics in the United States who were highly skeptical that they could work at all. While the generals have emphasized that war is not a video game, Desert Storm has shown the enormous value of advanced technology. And that experience will provide the Pentagon with powerful arguments for more money for future weapon systems. Robert Bazell, NBC News, New York. When Nightly News continues, Tom Brokaw in Kuwait City talks with Defense Secretary Dick Cheney. It's not just fresh, it's Contadina fresh. All right, so far it's not the most thrilling commercial in the world. How about this? No down payment, $249 a month. That's all it takes to get a new Pontiac Grand Prix. $249 per month, no down payment, with a 48-month GMAC smart lease for a new Pontiac Grand Prix. That's right, $249 per month and no down payment for a Grand Prix at Team Pontiac now. Pretty exciting commercial, huh? It seems that every time you turn around these days, another pain reliever with ibuprofen in it is comparing itself to Tylenol. But do you know what they can't say? They can't say they're gentler than Tylenol, because they're not. Tylenol won't irritate your stomach the way ibuprofen sometimes can. That's a medical fact. And is it any wonder that today hospitals use Tylenol 14 times more than ibuprofen? Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most. 
My name is ANA. My name is ANA. My name is ANA. Japan's favorite airline will soon offer non-stop and exceptional service between New York and Tokyo. ANA is like our family, and we bring honor to that family by making you happy. Experience what's behind our name. My name's ANA. Service begins March 9th. ANA, Japan's best to the world. To therapy known. One of the main architects of the success in the Persian Gulf is Defense Secretary Dick Cheney. And earlier tonight, I talked to him at his office in the Pentagon and asked how much longer American forces would have to stay in Iraq. Well, we're there, Tom, for military reasons. Uh, we did not go with any conscious design on Iraqi territory, but it was necessary in order to do an effective job of expelling them from Kuwait and destroying their army. Um, we obviously are in a position to stay as long as we need to, but we're not eager uh, for any kind of permanent presence there at the appropriate time. Uh, once we can resolve some of the outstanding issues with the Iraqis, obviously, uh, we will withdraw our forces from occupied territory. But could we be there as long as a month or six weeks? I really wouldn't want to speculate about it, Tom. It's conceivable I could get instructions to withdraw in a matter of days, or it might take a little longer than that. But I, we clearly don't want to do anything until we have the ceasefire arranged, until we've made progress in the implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions. There is going to be an unsettled situation here in the Middle East for some time to come from a political and a military point of view. Won't the United States have to take a security role here larger than what it had before this war began? Uh, we are prepared to be helpful to our friends in the area in terms of uh, creating new arrangements, but we really think they have to take the lead in terms of deciding what kind of arrangements uh, they're comfortable with. I would expect there will be a larger U.S. military presence, for example, in the Persian Gulf, where we've been for 40 years with naval assets. I would expect uh, joint exercises. I would expect uh, maybe pre-positioned equipment. Uh, but the president's made it clear that we want to avoid a major long-term ground presence uh, in, uh, in the Gulf. Were there for you some real sobering moments when you had reason to have real pause? Uh, there were times uh, last August when I was very concerned because I was fearful that Saddam Hussein uh, would not stop at the Kuwaiti border, but rather would come on down the Saudi coast. If he'd done that in uh, the middle of August, he would have captured the airfields and the ports that we use to get our forces into the country. And uh, he would have also controlled a significant additional part of the world's oil supply. We would have been in much, much uh, greater uh, difficulty in terms of trying to deal with the situation if he'd done that. That was a time of concern. Clearly, when the campaign actually began, the air campaign in the middle of January, uh, another moment of drama. Uh, the first day's results uh, were very impressive with only one aircraft lost. And then uh, the beginning of the ground campaign as well. There were a lot of experts, uh, most of them self-proclaimed, who predicted uh, thousands of casualties and all kinds of, uh, of uh, dangers out there. But of course, it turned out that uh, they were, were wrong, fortunately and uh, the experts that we had uh, doing the plan uh, out in Saudi Arabia and on the joint staff here with General Powell uh, turned out to be right. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much, and I suspect you'll sleep a little more soundly tonight. I will, Tom, and good luck in Kuwait City. Back in a moment with the economic effects of the war being over. He came into our house. He cooked us dinner. He told us the story of Catcher in the Rye. He, he said, said he was, was the son of Sidney Poitier. Ooh. I'm so sorry to bother you, but I've been hurt. His shirt's bleeding. His shirt isn't bleeding. He's bleeding. You gave him my pink shirt? You gave a complete stranger the keys to our house? This is so pathetic. This is so racist. That night was the happiest night I've ever had. I read somewhere that everybody on this planet is separated by only six other people. Six degrees of separation. Introducing the new S15 Jimmy four-door, because getting to work shouldn't be work. And just the new S15 Jimmy four-door has more leg room and cargo space, not to mention room for five campers and their gear. GMC truck. It's not just a truck anymore. It's quality on the road. Get special incentives on the new 91 S15 Jimmy four-door. We're working together to give our customers we the We asked best. our assistant what's buyers, the limit? what's the limit? How far can we go? In betting, we've got 50% savings. 50% off. Let's do better. Plus an extra 10% off sale prices. Great. And deferred billing. 
starts 90 days after delivery. Yes, 30-day home trial. And double the manufacturer's warranty. That's 50% plus an extra 10% off betting. Macy's Assistant Buyer's Days, Thursday through Saturday. We're here to give our customers what they want. Meanwhile, the Tokyo Ooh. stock market fought off. Morning. Ooh. Coffee's made. Cat's fed. It's all yours. I need to watch the weather. Your sister has a game this afternoon. You haven't seen the umbrella? Whoever you are, whatever you're doing, cable is there for you. Chinese. Japan. Cable. It's what you want when you want it. Whoa, one at a time. But my movie's on HBO. You just leave it then. Cable. It's part of life. It's time you had it. Second. Since the war began, America's self-confidence has soared. Two months ago, there was great uncertainty about the war and the economy. In December, only 28% of American voters thought the country was headed in the right direction. Now, two-thirds say the country is on the right track. The rising confidence is a boost for the economy. NBC's Mike Jensen has more. In California, with home prices and mortgage rates down, the real estate market is beginning to stir. Well, now that the war is over and the economy is going to pick up, so we feel it's a good time to buy. In Dallas, with auto dealers' lots overflowing, people are starting to buy. I think everybody's trying to just not think about the war anymore and maybe get into buying a new car or something. People are flying again. Even Kuwait Airways is gearing up. We had so many phone calls today. When are we going to fly back, fly to Kuwait? People are feeling more optimistic. Last month's gloomy statistics are ancient history. I was thinking of buying a television, and I was holding back, and now I think I will. As far as the economy goes, I think there's a vibrancy and excitement about uh, we've cleansed out something that's been a pain in our side. That's quite a switch. For months, the war kept Americans depressed and preoccupied. Now there's a peace dividend. With Kuwait rebuilding, U.S. companies are in for a bonanza. Also helping, the big surge in the stock market. It's put more money in a lot of pockets. Falling gasoline prices have done the same. People have more to spend. And with the ceasefire, they're spending it. I tend to see people spending more within this 24-hour period. You know, and, uh, and I attribute it to uh, the war being over. All that will help end the recession, but a warning. Recovery will be slow. There are a million more people out of work now than there were last August. And there are long-term problems, a huge federal budget deficit made worse by war costs, banks in trouble. Still, for all that, the mood of the country does seem to be changing. The crocuses are poking through. Mike Jensen, NBC News, New York. On Wall Street, stock prices fell slightly in very heavy trading. It's an extraordinary event, unequaled in circus history, when the very best artists and athletes from around the world unite in a spectacular tribute celebrating the American spirit. At Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus, it's the experience of a lifetime, and the memory will last forever. Coming to Meadowlands Arena and Nassau Coliseum, tickets to the box office or Ticketmaster. Great news. Harrow's February Super Sale has been extended, but you have only until this Monday night to save up to 50% off all swimming pools, up to 50% off all outdoor furniture, up to 50% off all barbecue grills, and save more than 50% off pool chemicals, accessories, and inflatables. These are Harrow's guaranteed lowest prices for the season. Get ready for summer fun now. Make no payments until September, but hurry. Harrow's February Super Sale positively ends Monday night. Products with the New York State seal of quality meet higher standards than most. So look for the New York State seal of quality for quality and taste that are a little above the rest. You'll find the seal of quality at these fine stores.
Gwen Nassau, Freeport, and 700 islands close by, which makes everything better in the Bahamas, <laughs> even the price. One of the first American units to arrive in Saudi Arabia last summer was the 24th Mechanized Infantry out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. And NBC's Ken Lee Jones is in Fort Stewart tonight to see how the people there are reacting to the news of the end of the war. What better birthday present for five-year-old Jessica Stevenson than the news that the war is over and that her father, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall Stevenson, will be coming home with the 24th Infantry Division. Now, Daddy kissed right there. You have to kiss that. At schools around Fort Stewart, home of the 24th, the children of soldiers who fought and won in the desert are proud and relieved. I'm glad um, when the war is over because um, I thought my dad was going to die. I'm proud of him that he went over there and did what he was supposed to and is coming back safely. Some of their mothers, while glad the shooting has stopped, are still cautious. Are you concerned about Saddam Hussein double-crossing us? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm still cautious of that uh, personality. Reserved happiness. Linda Craddock's husband, John, is the commander of one of the division's tank battalions. She would have had to assist the wives of soldiers killed in action against the Republican Guard. The 24th Entry Division had no soldiers killed during that day-long battle. I can't believe it. I mean, that, but that is one of the biggest reliefs I have. When the 14,000 men of the 24th left for Saudi Arabia last August, they left some businesses in the small town of Hinesville high and dry, and some with their heads barely above water. Uh, we've been impacted probably 40, 50 percent. But economic depression aside, civic and business leaders are determined to welcome the 24th back with a huge victory parade. We want to show these people that unlike when the troops came back from Vietnam, we're proud of what these boys did. Leading the parade will be the mayor of Hinesville, who, like everybody else here, is hoping for a speedy return of the 24th. He says they can drive those big tanks right down Main Street. We'll worry about fixing the pavement later. Kenley Jones, NBC News, Hinesville, Georgia. Jane, a nice note. I wish to say that's nightly news right after the minute from Kuwait City and New York. Meet the hot and talented Demi Moore. Take flight with Michael Air Jordan. And see the courageous comeback of Gloria Estefan on First Person with Maria Shriver tonight. Now is the perfect time, and the season is just right. You can play all day and dance into the night. And beautiful Mount Airy Lodge. New lower rates start at $70 per person per night at Mount Airy Lodge, Pocono Gardens, and Strickland's. Call 1-800-441-4410. All you have to bring is your love of everything. Beautiful Mount Airy Lodge. There's nothing in this world I wouldn't do for you. For you. I'd make a string of pearls out of the dew. Foxy lettuce. Crisp, mild, and nutritious. The pride of California's Salinas Valley. Every day, we put our reputation right on the table. Find out who got Howard Hughes' fortune on the next Memories Then and Now. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. America at Peace continues with Tom Brokaw in Kuwait City and Jane Pauley in New York. Good evening from Kuwait City. This special edition of America at Peace continues now, and here's the latest on what's left of the war in the Persian Gulf. Iraq is finally accepting President Bush's conditions for surrender. The ceasefire is holding. In Kuwait, the horror stories from the Iraqi occupation, some are exaggerated, but many others are just too real. And 85% approval. That's President Bush's latest job rating. It's the highest for a president of the United States since World War II. News of the ceasefire and Iraq's acceptance of many of the terms spread slowly here in Kuwait because the communications are so hit and miss. 
But NBC's Mike Betcher today was with a Marine regiment that helped liberate the Kuwaiti capital. Towards Kuwait City was obscured by a curtain of burning oil. At times, noon had been as dark as midnight on a moonless night. They were covered in a greasy rain, but at least for the final few miles, they had trucks in which to ride. The 3rd Regiment of the 3rd Marines had walked much of the way, slogging through wet sand and minefields, entering Kuwait a day before any other American unit. In an era of laser bombs and guided missiles, there still was a place for these mud Marines. They had marked the path for the others to follow. The ceasefire would bring a welcome rest. Now they were in Kuwait City. Victory, a bit of glory, and a ticket home were theirs. They got their country back. We helped them get it. Now it's time to go. At the entrance to the city, the Marines met jubilant Kuwaitis. But they also met an angry people, a people who had been unable to speak for almost seven months, a people who wanted to tell their story. Kill Saddam Hussein. Seven months, you don't know what happened in Kuwait. No, have anybody come in Kuwait to, to write, to, to put camera, what happened in Kuwait? Other military services accused Marines of doing things the hard way, but they had been given the hard job and succeeded. Along the way, India Company had stopped to mark the promotion of two of its enlisted men. Please. And salute. They had won another Chevron, and their corps had won back a desolate stretch of desert. Now they were ready to get home. When a Marine is ready, he will tell you that he is good to go. Now he will tell you it will be good to go home. Mike Betcher, NBC News, Kuwait City. And now a part of southern Iraq remains a kind of province of the United States Army, as there are military forces there to secure the transition from war to peace. NBC's George Lewis is a network correspondent with a pool of journalists with the Army engineers in Iraq. The Allies have occupied Iraq in a big way. They've bulldozed roads deep into the country and set up bases on Iraqi soil. For mile after mile, American convoys clogged the routes into southern Iraq. The Americans and their allies have brought enough troops, weapons, ammunition, and supplies to stay here a long time. <laughs> French forces occupy the Iraqi village of Al-Salman, which they took after a brief battle. Only a few villagers remain. At this schoolhouse, which the Iraqis used as their military headquarters, someone has defaced the portrait of President Saddam Hussein. The fact that the Allies now occupy a huge chunk of Iraq following the collapse of the Iraqi army adds up to a big humiliation for President Saddam Hussein. And the occupation gives the Allies considerable leverage in any post-war negotiations with the Iraqis. The GIs riding in the convoys are all hoping they won't have to remain here too long. We're uh, one step closer to being home. That's, that's what we're all dreaming for. Getting this wrapped up and getting back to family and friends. U.S. troops have been collecting and destroying Iraqi arms. This military police outfit from Fort Carson, Colorado, piled ammunition and assault rifles into a Soviet-made T-54 tank and threw an incendiary grenade into the tank's turret. Then they watched the fireworks. In the midst of all the Allied military activity, one pastoral scene, an Iraqi shepherd tending his flock. He said he was happy the shooting here had ended, adding the Arabic expression, Inshallah, if God wills it. George Lewis, NBC News, Southern Iraq. Secretary of State James Baker is scheduled to head to the Middle East next week, and one of the problems that now will move to center stage, Israel and the Palestinians. NBC's John Dancy is at the State Department tonight with more on that. John? Tom, with the war over, the U.S. is quickly turning its attention to winning the peace. In its own way, that will be just as difficult. We're just, I think everyone acknowledges, in a, in a different time here. A lot, a lot has happened in the last seven months. Indeed it has, so much so that Secretary of State James Baker will pay his first ever visit to Israel when he goes to the Middle East next week. Last June, Baker delivered a stinging public rebuke to the leaders of Israel. When you're serious about peace, call us. The State Department believes it now has its best chance in years to make some progress on the Palestinian problem. Clearly, the American people want that, 
Our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows that 85% of the people asked think a Middle East peace conference to resolve problems between Israel and the Arab nations is a good idea. Only 8% disapprove. 7% are not sure. Besides Israel, Baker's trip will take him to Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and the Soviet Union. Baker will also meet with the Emir of Kuwait, possibly in Kuwait City if the royal family has returned from exile by then. The military victory over Saddam Hussein was initiated by the UN Security Council, and it is the council that will decide many of the questions about Iraq's future. The immediate ones, whether to continue economic sanctions, whether to try Saddam and his leaders for war crimes, whether Iraq must pay for the damage it caused in Kuwait and elsewhere, and whether to continue an arms embargo. The U.S. position on that is clear. We have always said that if Saddam Hussein remains in power, it's the view of the United States government that an arms embargo must continue. That remains our view. On war crimes trials, 78% of the people in our poll said yes, Iraqi leaders should be put on trial. Another question for the coalition partners, whether there should be a regional security force for the area and whether it should include U.S. troops. Our survey showed that a surprising 55% of those questioned believe U.S. forces should remain. 37% said no. The message of a 